Okay. Testing. All right, it's on now. I don't know what happened. Amen. But nonetheless, amen. If it cuts out, then we'll know something. Praise the Lord, everybody. We'll get the job done. Amen. All right. Uh, we are continuing in our series on the secret key of revelation. Amen. Uh, and I believe we made it to slide, I want to say maybe five, six. Let me see where we were at. Uh, we made it, oh, no, we made it all the way through slide number seven. We made it all the way through slide number seven last week. Amen. So, uh, once again, just a few uh, preliminaries as we uh, as we move forward in the series. Amen. Uh, the things that we talked about in the introduction portion, amen, are going to continue to be important as we move forward. Amen. Uh, and so we want to retain uh, the principles that we talked about in the introduction portion. Uh, some of those are including the use of the language of creation and the language of uncreation. Uh, in that the language of uncreation speaks of the removal of order and structure and function and flow. The destruction of governments and things of that nature. Amen. We also talked about uh, prophetic language. Amen. Such as um, the sea or the ocean or vast waters being a representation of heathen nations uh, and um, uh, chaos, lawlessness, meaning Torahlessness, uh, lawlessness and the resulting death that comes from that. Amen. Uh, and so then very oppositely, the opposite of the sea or the waters or the ocean would be the earth or the land talking about the earth or the land, we are then talking about the holy people, Israel, the land of Israel, Jerusalem. We're talking about order and structure, function and flow, blessing and favor. Amen. So we want to hold on to those things as we are moving forward. Amen. Uh, they become more and more important. This portion of the series is dealing uh, with historical events. And these historical events are recorded by several sources, but the most important one uh, is an eyewitness, a Jewish man by the name of Josephus. He wrote a, a book called uh, The Antiquity of the Jews, The Antiquities of the Jews, amen. Within that book, amen, there is a portion that is called uh, The Wars of the Jews, and this is book six of The Wars of the Jews. It is describing uh, the destruction of Jerusalem that took place in the year 70 AD. Uh, this is something that most of us have some level of awareness of, uh, but the importance of it, uh, we've been robbed of understanding the importance of this event in scriptural history. Uh, this event that we just kind of skip over, you know, we say, oh, Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon another, and that's exactly what happened. The Romans came to destroy Jerusalem. Not one stone was left upon another, and then we move on. But you can't move on that fast. This is a major focal point of what Jesus was doing and saying. Uh, and so, uh, one of the other principles we talked about in the introductory lesson uh, was context. Uh, if we try to understand prophecy without the proper context, what we end up doing is trying to fit things into the context that we do have. And some of the stuff will appear to fit and some of the stuff will be problematic, but you can only use the context you have. But once you get the right context, you begin to find that you don't have to try to make things fit. When you get the right context, things just fit like they're supposed to, amen? All right, so, um, once again, we're going to try to do a speedy review to get us back through slide number seven and then move forward. Amen. So the secret key of Revelation 
and uh, this is the history portion of the series. Amen. We began by talking about the fact uh, that Rome came into power, amen, over the land of Israel uh, in the year 63 before Christ. Amen. Now, they took over from the Syrian Empire, uh, which was a portion of the Grecian Empire. Amen. Which is to say the Grecian Empire expanded quickly under Alexander the Great, and then the Grecian Empire was split into four portions. Amen. It was split into Egypt in the south, and then in the north toward the east you had Syria. Amen. Then you also had uh, Turkey or Anatolia and Greece itself. Amen. So the Syrian portion, which was to the north and to the east, also had rule over the land of Israel. And now, while the, the Grecian or the Syrian Empire was ruling, a man, a very famous uh, ruler of theirs by the name uh, of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, he took down, or rather I should say, he took away the priesthood from the family of Aaron and gave it to whomever he desired. Uh, and this means that Israel no longer had a legitimate priesthood. Amen. From that time uh, before Christ, all the way up until the time the temple was destroyed, they never even had legitimate priests functioning in the temple, which then also means all of their sacrifices are invalid. Everything happening there is invalid. Yes, sir. Uh, this, you, you probably won't have, have to go down the rabbit hole with this one. But I noticed the Romans, the Egyptians, the Syrians, the Babylonians, they all had jurisdiction over Israel. Is mm -hmm. it because of their disobedience? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, now, of course, uh, we know the original captivity had nothing to do with that. Uh, the original captivity in Egypt was for their benefit, which just goes to show that the Lord's ways are above our ways. Because we would say, Lord, why would you make us be slaves for, for 400 years and we ain't even did nothing? Amen. But that's because, remember, when Joseph led his people down into Egypt, there was a great famine in the land. If they stayed in Canaan, Canaan they probably would have starved to death. So they went into Egypt, the land of plenty, and then God set him up to put them to be uh, part of the aristocracy. They became uh, part of the ruling class. So they didn't start off as slaves. They started off as upper crust in Egypt. Amen. When, they, when Joseph brought them down, they were part of the upper crust. Amen. They were, they were part of the dignitaries in Egypt. Uh, and then as the book of Exodus tells us, eventually there arose a king who was not familiar with Joseph. Amen. Uh, or, or at the very least, didn't care for him, didn't care about any of that history, amen. And they saw that while the Jews, or while the Israelites, rather, were in Egypt, they multiplied like mad to the point where they said, it's almost more of them than it is us here. God was blessing them, be fruitful and multiply. So he took them down to Egypt, and that's what they did. They were fruitful, they multiplied, they had power and authority and prestige. So many of them that the, the Egyptian pharaoh said, um, if we don't watch out, these folk going to take out, they're going to take over. Now I can go into some history talking about why he would have had that thought. Amen. Um, but that's, that might take me off track. Amen. So maybe one day we'll come back. Amen. I actually have a series I talked before uh, on the history of the Exodus and what led to these things and how... Uh, recorded history, if you understand the right time, once again, you need the time context to understand what you're looking at in Egyptian history uh, because they're not going to call Joseph Joseph. They're not going to call Moses Moses. They're not going to make themselves look bad, you understand? But if you understand the right timing, you can look at Egyptian history and you can see what led up to the Exodus and when it happened. But we're going to move back forward. Amen? Uh, so at any rate, uh, Pharaoh saw that, uh, or perceived that the, the Israelites might be a problem, and so they enslaved them. So that had nothing to do with their own sin or unfaithfulness to God, but God was setting them up to bring them out as a nation of millions so that they could go into the promised land. Amen. And he took them out of slavery and was taking them into a land flowing with milk and honey, with houses they didn't build and gardens they didn't plant. It was God's plan. Amen. 
when things start going down in our life, when we get trapped in a season we don't like, we feel like God has abandoned us. But have we ever considered, amen, that we have become Israel, amen, and God follows the same pattern, amen? Before you can build a skyscraper up to the clouds, first thing you got to do is you got to build, you got to dig a deep hole. And the higher you want to build, the, the lower you've got to dig, amen? Amen. So, but at any rate, moving back towards the question that was asked, amen, after that, amen, uh, pagan nations having dominion over them is a part of the curse, amen, and that is the curse that comes with the, uh, uh, the covenant that they accepted at Mount Sinai, amen, that includes uh, things in, in captured in Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, which is to say, uh, when foreign nations rule over the people of God, when they have them under their thumb, when they have to pay taxes to other folk and follow uh, foreign laws, amen, this is a sign that they have sinned and put themselves out of position with God. So once again, God was giving many, 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 many signs. Amen? Assyria coming and taking away the northern ten tribes of the kingdom of Israel should have been a sign to Judah. But Judah saw the sign, but they didn't change the pattern. And since they didn't change the pattern, they got the same result. And then Babylon came and took them away. Amen? Now, when the warning comes and God strike your brother, look like you ought to say, oh, God ain't playing. Let me, let me straighten up. But you know what? Most of us don't. We know other folk who did the same dumb stuff we did and got the same result. and We still went and did it. Amen. All right. All right. So uh, at, at any rate, trying to, <laughs> try to move forward. Amen. So uh, the Romans, when they took over, they, they continued that same course of making anybody a priest they wanted to. Amen. So this uh, was an offense to the Jews. And then the Romans added to it that they put a king over Israel that was not, uh, or rather they put a king over Judea who was not a Jew. He wasn't from the line of David, amen, but instead he was an Edomite, and that is Herod the Great, all right? So now Israelites, or the, the Jews rather, are upset. Jews are Israelites, so I'm trying to be specific, amen. Uh, the Jews are upset already because you have invalidated our priesthood. We don't have valid priests. We don't have a valid high priest. Now you've put one of our enemies over us to rule us as king, Amen. One more sign that we are under the judgment of God. Amen. Uh, and then, we, as we discussed, during the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, amen, uh, Rome had had six Caesars. The, the, the sixth one was currently ruling. Amen. So that was Julius Caesar, who was succeeded by his nephew, Caesar Augustus, who was succeeded by his nephew, Tiberius Caesar, who was succeeded by his cousin, Caligula, who was succeeded by his cousin, Claudius Caesar, uh, who was succeeded by his nephew, Nero Caesar. And of course, Nero is the crazy king, a man who burns down his own capital city and then blames it on the Christians so that the Romans wouldn't kill him. Amen. Thus begins the, persecute, the persecution of the Christians under Rome. And they didn't persecute them only in the city of Rome, but they persecuted them throughout the Roman Empire. Amen. And so most of the writings of Paul, uh, most of the New Testament is being written during this persecution where Christians are being thrown to the lions, they're being torn asunder, they're being imprisoned, uh, they're being tortured, amen, they're being persecuted. You, you, you know what? Uh, a Bible word for persecution and trouble like that? Tribulation. That's what the word tribulation means. It means trouble. Trouble and persecution. Yea, and all who would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's tribulation. It's the same word. Amen? All right. So, um, the Romans installed a procurator 
in Judea named Gessius Florus, an evil man who stole money from the temple. He stole money from the temple. We're already upset we don't have a valid priesthood. Now you got this guy in charge of us that's stealing money from the temple. Amen. And on top of that, he killed 3,600 people over the course of only five months. And that is just ridiculous. He's just putting people to death left and right. All of this infuriated the Jews over time. Amen. It all built up. Uh, and then in the year 66 AD, amen, uh, they killed the high priest and the Jews revolted. And that means they rebelled. They took a rebellious stand against the Romans. Amen. I was kind of getting into this a little bit last week, and I don't know if I said what I intended to say about it, but the, uh, the Jews had compromised with the Romans. Remember me saying that? Amen. Uh, the leadership, the ruling class, the priesthood, which remember, these aren't legitimate priests. They're not from the family of Aaron. They're not Levites. Amen. But the, the, pre, uh, the priests who were assigned to that political power position by the Romans were in cahoots with the Romans. The king, who is not a Jew, but was put in position by the Romans, is in cahoots with the Romans. And the rich folk who are maintaining their wealth by working with the Romans, are in cahoots with the Romans. So basically, the leadership of the Jews is compromising with the Romans, including the fact that even though they're not making a sacrifice to Caesar as God, they made the compromise of making a sacrifice on behalf of Caesar daily in the temple. And that sacrifice, that, that compromise, is still considered to be idolatry. Amen. Because it is still an acknowledgement, even though... They're, they're rationalizing it in their own mind. Well, I'm not worshiping Caesar, but you're still acknowledging a sacrifice in the realm of Caesar who is taken by the rest of the Roman Empire to be a god. It's still idolatry. Amen. You know, we'll work stuff out in our own mind to make ourselves feel better. You know, like, oh, you know, I'm not doing that. It's just, you know, I, I don't mean it the way they mean it. I'm just hanging around the perimeter of it. You know, I'm just trying to get along. You know, I don't want to go along to get along and all that. No, 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 no. We stand for the righteousness of God. And if folk going to hate us, they just got to hate us. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. I'm trying to contain myself. Pastor, is it just me? I won't get offended. Or is this prophetically speaking what's going on right now? Some of this in this lesson. There's only one reason we even talk about this. Yes, sir. Because as I said, God works in patterns. And if we follow the pattern of the wrong people, we're going to end up with the same result the wrong people got. So as we're going through this lesson, if you see now what we're talking about then, just understand, get off that boat <laughs> and get into the ark. Amen. We, we got to be, be running with the Lord not against him, because if you run against him, it's not going to work out too well for you. The great tragedy of this story, the great tragedy of this story is that the Jews continued to see themselves as the elect people of God who could not be destroyed because God is on our side, not understanding that it is God who is bringing the destruction on you. You know what's worse than that? This is the same thing that caused them to get destroyed by Babylon. They had the same mindset when God was sending Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, God would never do that to his people. But he did. They had the same thought in the northern kingdom of Israel when, when they were getting ready to get destroyed by the Assyrians. Oh, God would never do that to his elect. And he did. Because judgment begins at the house of God. Before God judges the world, he's going to judge his people. And then, once his people have been purified, then he's going to turn around and judge the world who he used to judge his people. That's the pattern. God sent Assyria to destroy Israel. Then he destroyed Assyria. God sent Babylon to destroy Judah. Then he destroyed Babylon. He sent Persia to destroy Babylon. Then he destroyed Persia. He sent Greece to destroy Persia. Then he destroyed Greece. Amen. There's a pattern. 
So my question is, where do we fit into the pattern? Which part of the pattern are we following? Amen, somebody. All right, so all of that was to say this. The Jews had, uh, meaning the leadership of the Jews, and as goes the leadership, so goes the people, had staked themselves with Rome. We have no king but Caesar. That's what they said when, when Jesus was on trial, is it not? Is this man the king of the Jews? We have no king but Caesar. Corporate idolatry. They staked themselves with Rome. Their faith was in Rome. Their trust was in Rome. We're safe. Ooh. Oh, Lord. I've got all kinds of different things going on here. Other, other stuff I forgot to include. Their safety was in they trusted that nobody would attack a Roman province. Because who wanted with Rome? Or let me say it another way. Who can make war with Rome? Nobody. You, you, you know what uh, Tiberius Caesar brought in? The, the, uh, not Tiberius, I'm sorry. Augustus Caesar. One of the reasons, remember his name is actually Octavius. They, they nicknamed him Augustus, which means worthy of worship. One of the reasons they did that is because he produced what is called Pax Romanus. Pax Romanus means the peace of Rome. Under his rule as Caesar, there became a peace throughout the entire Roman Empire. There was no war. Nobody wanted it with Rome. It's the Roman peace. And being a part of the Roman Empire means you have peace and safety. And the leaders of the Jews and the liberals of the Jews, they didn't want any smoke with Rome, who was already over them, because they wanted to maintain peace and safety. Amen? All right. And in all that, you would think, well, for their own peace and safety, they'd stay where they're supposed to be, but then they revolted against the one they trusted in. Against, oh, let me say it another way. They rebelled. They took a rebellious stand against the one in whom they trusted and the one whom they obeyed. By the way, what do you call that when you trust and obey? That, that's the Hebrew word, but what do we call that in English? Faith. The Jews had faith in Rome. They didn't really have faith in God. They didn't trust in God to protect them. They trusted in Caesar. They trusted Caesar, so they wanted to obey Caesar until they rebelled against Caesar. But even in that rebellious stand, they still continued to have conflict with themselves. All right. As a result of this rebellion, Nero sent General Cestius Gallus to destroy I mean, to send him to Jerusalem to crush or destroy the rebellion. They revolted. He says, hey man, go down there and squash that nonsense. He's not, he not that concerned. Cestius Gallus, he's not like the top general. He didn't have the biggest army. He said, oh, them guys down there, they're not ready for us. Just go down there. And they'll probably surrender when you show up. They don't really want it. So they went down there, amen, and they surrounded Jerusalem. The Jews didn't see him coming. They didn't expect him. The Roman army showed up. They're all panic struck. <gasps> We don't know what to do. The Romans quickly got through the wall and into a portion of the city. I believe it's the northern portion of the city. The Jews are already ready to surrender because they weren't ready to fight. And then for some unknown reason, the general and his army retreated. And history has never given anybody with a, a real reason for why this happened. But we know they turned around and they ran. They left the city and they took off out into the wilderness and the Jews, seeing them running, were emboldened by this. They said, you see, God is on our side. Which, I mean, that's a logical thing to think. And they ran out there and they destroyed every Roman. They killed the entire Roman legion that come down to fight them. And so now they really, yeah, we got it. We the ones. And now this causes more of them to be emboldened to resist against Rome, who they were already upset with. Amen. Now. Uh, the Christians, when they saw Jerusalem being surrounded by the armies, desired to flee to the mountains, but they couldn't flee to the mountains because Jerusalem was surrounded by armies until, for some reason, it suddenly wasn't. 
when the Romans left, the Christians left. Well, most of them. You know, you don't never have 100% of anybody doing anything. But the grand majority of the Christians left the city, and they fled to the mountains and uh, to different cities and whatnot. Uh, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, don't even come down off the rooftop to get your jacket. Just run. And that's what they did. As soon as they could, they got out of Dodge. Go ahead, sir. Pastor, I've never got a clear answer. Not here, but I haven't asked this question here concerning the zealots. Um, were they Christians like a, a faction of Christians that believe in using a sword against the Romans, or they were just some radicals, the zealots? Uh, no, this was a faction of Jews. Uh, none of these people, or at least not after they became Christian, none of them were Christians. Amen. Obviously, that was not the Christian way. The instruction Jesus gave them was, when you see it coming, run. He didn't say take a sword. He didn't say you'll build a wall. He said get out of Dodge. And so the Christians believed what Jesus said, and as soon as they were able to do what he said, they did what he said. Amen. Now, of course, you know, the, the rest of the Jews are going to look at them as deserters, which they didn't like the Christians anyhow. Remember, for the last almost 40 years, they had been persecuting the Christians. The Jews began killing the Christians way back after uh, you know, Christianity first began on the day of Pentecost. The Jews began persecuting the Christians. They killed James, and they had Peter and was going to kill Peter too. Amen? The angel came and led Peter out of the prison. And he thought it was a dream. Amen. And all this, uh, they, they, were, they didn't like the Christians. They didn't, they didn't like them taking away authority and uh, people following. They didn't like them taking them away from the Sadducees and from the, the Pharisees and from the priests. Amen. They, they basically said, y'all trying to do something different. You know, we didn't like this Jesus guy when he was here. Now he's gone and y'all still trying to, no, we don't like y'all. And so the persecution of the Jews is what caused them to first scatter out of Jerusalem and began to evangelize the world, which is what Jesus told them to do to start with. Amen? Go ye into all the world. But for the first, like, uh, I want to say almost eight years, they just stayed there in Jerusalem until they were forced to scatter. All right. So now what's going on inside of Jerusalem is you got different factions in Jerusalem that fight each other for control and I mean killing each other. There's blood in the streets, amen. Uh, as you start off with two factions fighting for control, and it ends up becoming three factions fighting for control and uh, ambushing each other, and everybody wants to be in charge of what's going to happen and how we're going to fight. Every, and, and the reason they can't come together, this should sound familiar, everybody wants to be the big man. I know y'all y'all following uh, y'all following Simon, but I'm John, and I think y'all ought to be following me. And my my captain with me, his name is Eleazar, but after a while, he don't want me to be the big man. He wants to be the big man. That's how we end up three. Now all three of them are being seen as the Messiah by their followers. All three of them are being seen as the the great deliverer of God's people. And, of course, we know none of them are because Messiah is Jesus. He already came and went. Amen? But you have to remember, the Jews don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. And to this very day, they're waiting for the Messiah who already came. But when you don't see the real Messiah, it's easy to be led astray by false messiahs. False messiahs, right? <laughs> okay, so... Uh, so the Jews are unable to establish a unified government because there's so much infighting and there is no order, no rule of law, so chaos reigns. And I'm going to get ahead of myself, amen, but I'm going to say this uh, because I forgot to go to the board uh, with this last week, amen. But this is the state of what we call uncreation. What you have is uncreation in Jerusalem. The loss of order, the loss of structure, the loss of law. There's no law. There's chaos in the street. Everybody doing whatever they think they ought to be doing, following who they think they ought to be following. The sun refuses to shine. The moon is like blood. The stars have fallen from the sky. The order has been destroyed. 
the same language God used when he spoke about the day of the Lord that came on Babylon. When you read in the book of Isaiah, God prophesying destruction on Babylon, amen, he said that the sun would not shine and the moon would be turned to blood and the stars fell from the sky. And we know that that wasn't literal because the sun is still there and the moon is still there and the stars are still there, amen. So this is the language of uncreation. He's saying your, your order will be destroyed. And that's exactly what has happened. The Jews have no order. They have no government. And because of chaos, it circles back. It circles back up to death. Death is reigning in the streets of Jerusalem. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself for where I'm going. So uh, let me come on down. Emperor A, uh, in AD 67, Emperor Nero released General Vespasian, Vespasian to go forth and conquer the Jews. He began in the northern part of Judea and came down city by city, slaughtering everyone in sight. The streets, fields, and rivers were filled with the bodies of Jewish men, women, and children, even to the point where every river and stream was filled with blood. And the blood that was in the River Jordan from the cities to the north of it turned the River Jordan red so that the Jews, amen, could see the sign. The same sign he gave in Egypt, he turned the, the river to blood. Now the Jews are seeing the same, but it's the blood of their kinsmen. It's the blood of Jews. It is implying judgment is coming on the Jews. Amen. All right. Now, the liberals in Jerusalem want to submit to Rome. The conservatives eventually burn the food supply in order to force the Jews to fight Rome for survival. So not only do you have three uh, groups of... Um, rebels uh, who, who want to fight, but you also have a group of liberals who want to surrender. That's going to be primarily, once again, the rich folk, the priests, the royal family. They say, no, no, we don't want to fight. That's our friends. We don't want to fight them. But the people are on the side of the rebels who want to fight. Amen? And so eventually, as I said, uh, the, the conservatives, the rebels, they end up burning the food supply, which creates within the walls of Jerusalem a man-made famine. Within the walls of Jerusalem, the holy city, there is a food shortage because they destroyed their own food. They had enough food in the city of Jerusalem. Remember I said when, when Nero sent the first general, they weren't prepared. The Jews didn't know it was coming. If the Romans would have stayed, the whole thing would have been over. But because they ran away and the Jews killed them, now they get ready. They build the walls, they make the walls bigger, they make the walls higher, they make the walls thicker, they bring all the food stores in, they fill up their granaries. They've got food stored up. They could stand a siege for years. Some people estimate they could have stayed in there for eight years. Ain't too many siege gonna last for eight years. If you, you last for two years, maybe, most time the people trying to take the city would just go home. But they burned up the food to the point where now people are scavenging for food. To the word, uh, Josephus reports they were eating leather belts, they were eating leather sandals, they were eating the grass, they were chewing the dirt. Women began to eat their own infants. Now remember, all this going on while you have different factions killing each other. So now bodies are being snatched off the street to feed families. This is one of the curses from Deuteronomy 28. If you will not do the things that I tell you to do, you're going to end up cannibalizing yourselves. Amen? All right. Uh, in AD 68, Nero committed suicide. Rome then in one year had four emperors each one slaying the prior, until finally they settle with Vespasian, who in AD 69 leaves the war in Judea to claim the crown as Caesar. So now Vespasian has come down city by city, and he's gotten almost to Jerusalem uh, when he, he gets word from Rome that we keep, you know, Nero has killed himself. We get a different Caesar every few months. We've had three of them now, and the guy we have now Nobody likes him. We want you. So the people have chosen Vespasian. He's the great chief general of Rome. So he said, oh, they want to give me the crown. Let me get on back over here. So he goes back to Rome to claim the throne as Caesar. He leaves in charge his right-hand man, who is his son. 
Titus. So Titus now becomes General Titus. Anybody ever heard of the Arch of Titus in Rome? Amen. This, what we're reading about, is the reason why the Arch of Titus is there. Amen. So he leaves Titus to finish up what he started. He's already led them down through Judea city by city, wiping out every Jew in sight. Amen. So now he leaves Titus uh, to finish the deal, amen, of conquering the Jews. As the Roman armies approach Jerusalem inside the walls of the city, the Jews are slaying each other. As the Roman armies are approaching to fight the Jews, the Jews are still inside the city killing each other. Now, this should maybe make you think about all the times in the Old Testament where God caused the enemies of Israel to turn and fight themselves. You will not need to fight in this battle. Amen. Why? Because God would cause confusion, uncreation in the camp of the enemies. And without order, people start slaying them on selves. So now he turns it back on the Jews. Here comes the Roman army to destroy them, but they're already destroying themselves to the point where when Titus got the word of what was going on in the city, he said, well, let's just hang out out here. They're going to do the job for us. That sounds kind of familiar, too. You know, that sounds kind of familiar even to this area we're sitting in right now. And them folk over there killing themselves. We don't have to put on a white sheet. We just wait, sit back and wait. They're going to kill themselves off. Anyhow, uncreation, no leadership, no organization, no structure, no function, no flow. All right? So um, the Jews are both slaying each other, and at the same time, they are starving to death inside the walls of Jerusalem. This is a horrible tragedy. Amen? All right. And this is the slide we ended on last week as we come down to our last few minutes this week. Amen. For one year before Jerusalem fell, a comet hung in the sky in the shape of a sword directly above the temple. There was a comet hanging in the sky shaped like a centaur, a sword above the temple. Now, you know, comets don't hang in one spot. This comet moved through the sky till it got above the temple and it stopped right there. And for a year, it hung above the temple. Amen. Now, the Jews saw this as a sign that something important was going to happen. But they, you know, because they have it in their mind, they are delusional that they're going to win. They don't see it for what it is. But the Romans, the pagans, y'all, the idolaters, correctly interpret the sign. Oh, this is a sign that Jerusalem's going to fall. The sword of heaven is on them. Hmm. We talked about a few other signs. For 40 years, from AD 30 to AD 70, the red cord did not turn white on the Day of Atonement. Amen. Once again, that was uh, one part of the red cord was tied to the scapegoat. The other part of the red cord was tied to the door of the temple. When the scapegoat was released into the wilderness, the red cord on the door of the temple would turn white, thusly showing, amen, uh, that the sins of the people had been expiated by the Lord. Well, it did not turn white, which is showing that uh, their, a day of atonement is no longer valid. Why is it no longer valid? They don't need it anymore because Jesus has died on the cross and you, you don't need the training wheels anymore. We have the actual thing we've been rehearsing. Amen? In the year A.D. 60, a red heifer that was about to be sacrificed by the high priest gave birth to a lamb. A cow gave birth to a lamb. And, and it wasn't something that happened in secret behind the walls. This was all the priests were standing there. Amen. The high priest was about to sacrifice the red heifer, and the thing was pregnant, and out pops a lamb. Amen. Once again, pointing to the idea that you don't need these sacrifices anymore. God has already given us the lamb. All right. At Pentecost one year, the priest heard voices as a great multitude in the inner court saying, let us remove hence. So that's voices from inside the temple. Nobody's in there. But the priest heard like a great crowd of people coming from the inside of the temple who said, let us remove hence. Which would imply that, that those are the voices of the divine council 
who are now abandoning the temple. Your house has been left to you desolate. Amen. All right, new material. <laughs> General Titus then arrives at Jerusalem with a Roman army composed of soldiers from various parts of the Roman world, the known world. By the way, um, I kind of made this just a small note, but when, when Vespasian went back to Rome, he took a good portion of his best warriors with him because when you're going to claim the throne, you can't go by yourself. There's a guy sitting on the throne. Even though the people want you on the throne, you got to take some people who know how to fight with you so he takes his best warriors back to Rome with him. So Titus has to send out the call to other Roman provinces around to send their armies to help them to finish the work of taking down the Jews. So when it comes time to take Jerusalem, you have a few Romans, you have a majority of Syrians. Remember that Syria is just north of Rome. And then you also have some Arabians, you have some Persians, you have some Egyptians, uh, you have some Jordanians, you have people from all around the surrounding nations of Jerusalem have come together, amen, to war against them. They lay siege to the city, and this siege would last for five months. This is the last five months of Jerusalem, amen, where the people of Jerusalem will be tormented uh, for the last five months. Now, the feast of Passover arrived, and so Titus is a genius. Remember, well, you might not remember, amen. Last week I was telling you Josephus was one of the only survivors of them slaying the people from the northern cities, and so Josephus becomes an assistant to Vespasian, and then Vespasian goes back, so Josephus becomes an assistant to Titus. Joseph is a Jew, he's a Pharisee, Amen. He's a scholar, and he had been a governor of one of their cities. He understands warfare. He understands the Jews because he is one. So he's helping the Romans destroy the Jews because he's an insider. He's a Benedict Arnold. Amen. So he informs Titus, hey, it's Passover, and whatever Jews are left are going to come up to Jerusalem for the Passover because that's what we do. Not only that, Jerusalem is probably the most fortified city in the world. This would be the hardest place to break into. Amen? Uh, imagine if you got one guy to kill and he's hiding inside Fort Knox. Amen? So since Titus is now informed that the Passover's come and more Jews are going to show up, so he allowed pilgrims to enter the city. So the city that probably had between three and a half thousand to maybe 500,000 people now we'll have over a million Jews inside. Now this is genius warfare. He knew this would put strain on their resources. Remember, they're already in there fighting and killing each other, and they already are starving to death. Then you add another five or 600,000 people into the mix. It's going to be a scene of absolute chaos and horrid, disgusting death and nastiness there's too many people. They don't have enough places to stay. Everywhere in the streets they go, there's dead bodies. Down every street, there's dead bodies laying along the street. There's flies. There's feces. There's stench. It's horrible. But of course, you notice I said he let them enter. They're not letting anybody leave. He let them, oh, yeah, it's time for your feast. We understand. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're all going to die. That's what he's doing. All right. As the Romans prepare battering rams and other siege works to break through the walls of Jerusalem, the Jews sneak out at night to attack the Romans and burn their siege works. Now, they, they weren't giving up without a fight. At night, they, they actually dug tunnels under their own walls and they, it would secret you know, entrances. So at night, they would come out of those secret entrances 
And the Romans are building siege works. So they cut down the trees and they're building battering rams and they're, they're building um, catapults to throw stones over the wall, all kinds. And so the Jews come out at night and kill as many Romans as they can and set fire to the battering rams and set fire to the catapults. Like, we ain't gonna make it easy for you to take us. Besides the fact that our walls are nearly impenetrable, we don't even wanna let you have the tools that you wanna try to use to get through them. They're fighting back, all right? Now, this was unheard of strategy. Rome had never seen anybody do this. Y'all actually coming outside the wall. The wall is your protection. Y'all so crazy, y'all coming outside the wall, but we're not expecting it. We've never seen that before, so we sleep. <laughs> y'all show up killing us in our sleep, and then by the time we get it together and get our cavalry going, y'all run back through the tunnels, and we can't find the entrance. Amen. The, the, the Jews was a, a formidable force. Even though they're fighting against... Now, if they were this good at fighting off the Romans when they couldn't even get along with each other, imagine, imagine if they'd been on one accord. But one accord is broken because they're under the curse. All right? Um, so this was unheard of strategy, which forced the Romans to build embankments for defense while preparing to attack. Now, this, once again, this is unheard of. When you lay siege to a city, you don't build embankments to protect yourself from the people who are on the other side of the wall, and the wall is there to protect them. So for the first time in history, the attacking army that has the city surrounded has to build walls of dirt to protect themselves from the people who are inside the city. All right. When Titus and the Romans finally break through the various layers of defense, and this takes a great long time, takes them almost the entire five months to just get inside the city. Amen. Um, when they break through the various layers of defense and enter the inner portion of Jerusalem, they find hundreds of thousands of Jews already dead from infighting. Dead bodies were strewn about the city everywhere. Many corpses were dumped and piled up outside the wall of Jerusalem in the valley of Tophet. Tophet is also called Gehenna. Now, this is significant. They had so many dead bodies, they were dumping dead bodies over the wall of Jerusalem trying to get rid of some of these corpses. And they were dumping them in a very specific place. That place is called Tophet or Gehenna. Tophet or Gehenna is a pit where they would burn garbage. So they're dumping their dead family members into the garbage pit. And then they would burn them there. This is even more significant because at one point in the Old Testament, the Jews had a shrine built in Tophet to a foreign god. Just outside the wall of Jerusalem, they had a shrine in Tophet where they burned their children. And the one they burned it to was named Molech. The demon god of the dead, Molech. So his house was at the place called Tophet, which became known as Gehenna. Now, when you read about Gehenna in your English Bible, it's usually translated hell. And you could probably understand why. It's a pit of fire. Amen. But it was a literal, real place on the physical plane. Amen. But the image of the wicked people being thrown into Gehenna was literally fulfilled in the wars of the Jews as the Romans come to destroy Jerusalem. Now, before I get to the, to the last few things, amen, I want to say this also. Uh, when the Romans were using their catapults to throw stones, they were throwing stones that were almost half-ton stones over the walls, lobbing them over the walls, and these things came in, they're basically just missiles coming in to strike and destroy. You know, wherever they hit, they're gonna leave a crater in the ground. Uh, but they were throwing these giant white stones over the wall. So, now Jerusalem has watchmen on the wall uh, who would call out when the stone is being thrown, okay? But now, the people have been warned by the Christians Remember, this is 40 years after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. They had been warned that judgment was coming from God and that the sun 
Jesus, would see his judgment on the people. So when the, throne, when the stones were thrown, some translations of what is written says that the watchman on the wall would cry out, the stone cometh. But some of them are written to have said, the sun cometh. Remembering these stones are literally the judgment of God flying over the walls to destroy them. Just interesting. Just interesting. All right. Uh, that should say many instead of may. <laughs> many Jews starved to death and even resorted to eat their own children and other corpses. The stench of death was horrid and disease ran rampant through the population. Disease. Pandemic. Epidemic. God, God had told them that if you will walk with me and do as I say, I will not bring any of the diseases of Egypt upon you. But in another place, he told them that if you don't follow me, I will bring all of these and more on you. And what do you think is going to happen when you have no source of pure water, uh, you have no food, you have cannibalism, you have death everywhere, feces piling up everywhere, flies everywhere? You've got to have disease start running rampant. That's what's going to happen. Amen? Not only that, but you got folk so hungry, they eating people who are dead, who they know had diseases. But rather than starve to death, I'm going to eat this diseased man, you eating the disease and passing it right on along. Amen. So this is it. Now, at this point, we have over a million people locked inside the walls. They can't leave. There are some Jews who tried to sneak out at night to go surrender. But when Jews would sneak out at night to go surrender, the Romans would catch them and crucify them. Several thousands, several tens of thousands of Jews were crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem while the siege was going on. But remember, it wasn't just the Romans. They had people from other places. So some of the uh, Arabian soldiers who were part of the Roman Empire who were there to fight, if they caught Jews sneaking out, Somebody had tipped them that Jews might sneak out and having swallowed jewels to try to take some money with them. So when the Arabians caught Jews who snuck out of the city to surrender, instead of letting them live, they'd split them open from head to sternum to check their bowels to see if they had any jewels inside of them. So even if you surrender, it's not going to go well. Let me tell you something. When you're under the judgment of God, you're not going to get away from it. Amen. If you don't repent while he told you to repent, it's too late to repent afterward. We got to get it right now. Amen. All right. Uh, the stench of death was horrid and disease ran rampant. All right. The final battle. The final battle for the temple. One of the Roman soldiers threw a burning ember through a door. There was a, a low golden door in the temple, amen, and then I'm, I'm really shortening this whole thing down because every step, they had to go through like five or six different portions to get into the inner sanctum of the city where the temple is. This took them, that's that, that five months of fighting, and this war which has gone on about three and a half years. And so, they're at the end of it now, amen. And they've gotten into the temple, and one of the Roman soldiers throws a burning ember through a low door into the temple, and uh, the entire temple burned to the ground. The temple of God, the house of God, burned to the ground. Uh, now, the Jews are dumbfounded, because how could this possibly happen? We just knew God was going to rescue us, even though we had every sign to tell us that we are actually under the curse. But we within ourselves, we just knew God was going to rescue us. How can it be that the city has been broken into and the temple has been burned down? Upon seeing the temple on fire, the Romans went into berserker bloodlust rage and started hacking every Jew they saw to pieces, even the priests. Now remember, the priests did not want to fight the Romans. The priests and the royal family and the wealthy people wanted to surrender. But now that the Romans have gotten in, 
We've been out here trying to get in here for five months. Y'all been sneaking out and attacking us and setting us on fire and shooting flaming arrows at us. We mad. We done burnt down your temple and we just swinging the sword and killing anything we see. We kill a, a lady with her infant in her hand and then kill the infant too. They just killing everything. They're going to kill the priest, the high priest. If they find anybody from the world, anybody they see that's not a Roman soldier, they're killing it. Slinging blood everywhere. Amen. They just, and when, when it is described going into this berserker bloodlust rage, what you can really see is the demonic power swell on them. And they went out of their mind just killing. Just, uh, are there any children in here? Amen. For, for lack of a better word, it was a blood orgy. They just went insane. Just, amen. So, I can't even, I'm not doing justice <laughs> in trying to paint the picture, amen, of, of what happened here, amen. Now, Titus did not want the temple destroyed. He wanted to preserve the temple. The temple is one of the wonders of the world. It's one of the glories of the Roman Empire. They wanted to maintain it. Now, of course, they wanted to turn it into a temple of Caesar, but he did not want it destroyed. Amen. But in the midst of the battle rage, he couldn't calm 